it frightens me to think that so many doctors get a weekend nutrition course during the course of their entire training. And you know, their, their perspective on nutrition is very, very limited. And that many times they're actually dissuading their patients from taking supplements because they just are misinformed. They used to really bother me, it used to make me angry, but now I realize that we're all a product of our training. So you, know, you only can help somebody with what you know. So the goal for me is always to kind of search and research and look and, and grow so that we can further the health of the patient. People take supplements because they want to feel better or they want to have more energy or because somebody told them to and say, hey, you know, I've been taking this supplement, you should too. Or, you know, I really don't eat so well, maybe I should take a supplement. So there are a lot of different motivations out there with people who are actually supplementing and what we want to do is kind of wrap our heads around that both from a consumer's perspective, for our, you know, from, from our own health, but also from a retail perspective. We don't want to be guessing when it comes to taking nutritional supplements because right now we kind of feel that they're innocuous. Like, oh, you're just going to take vitamins. Most of them are water soluble. They'll pass right through you. It's not that big of a deal. But what we're finding is very, very different. You know, we, we know now that the methylation cycle is very powerful and it's linked to cancer. And if you take methylated supplements in, in excess, who knows what those long-term ramifications might be. So it's not what you take, it's what you absorb. And this is really key because we walk around all the time with the idea that I'm taking my B12, I'm taking my fish oil, I'm taking you know, my, my vitamin D, but we're taking these orally and we don't really know if what we take makes it into the system. What we really want to know is, is this stuff getting into my cells? Is this doing what I hoped it would do? And the only way you're really going to know that is if you do some testing. Functional gastrointestinal issues are one of the most prevalent problems in our society. So people with GERD, irritable bowel, you know, mild constipation here and there, you know, food intolerances, all these things are all functional GI problems. And when you have them, it really impacts the rest of your body. Because everything that goes into your system actually has to come through your gut in order to make it into circulation, the microbiome. It's getting a ton of press. We're seeing patients that have microbiome imbalances in all the neuropsychiatric conditions. And we're, and we're evaluating these patients and treating them at this level and we're seeing results. So it's, it's really intriguing to understand that what we do on a natural health basis can impact every disorder. I see everything in my office from autism to Alzheimer's disease. I work with a team of doctors of all dis different disciplines. And the, great, the greatest thing was I have a psychologist who recently joined my practice. So when he first started, he didn't have any patients. So he saw my patients with me. So I had a patient come in and they had depression. And he's looking at me like, you're not a psychologist. What are you going to do for depression? I'm like, just sit back and relax. Let's, let's let this unfold. And we start going through a case history. And we start talking about their biology. And then I explain to them that what we're going to do is not treat their depression, but look for imbalances in their system. Because biochemical imbalances in your, in your body are going to have profound impacts you know, in a negative way on your brain. So he then would do his own psych eval on this patient. And then we would collaborate on what we thought was wrong. And then we would do blood, urine, stool, and genetic profile on this patient. So now we got not only the, the clinical picture, which is I feel sad, I feel unmotivated, all the, all the, you know, the different symptoms of depression, and, you know, and he's looking at you know, what's going on in the past and you know, how is your family and you know, all these different things, which I acknowledge and believe me, I never would poo-poo that. But when the test came back, he was blown away. And I said, look, here are all the problems. We're going to fix this and this depression is going to get better with your help and we're going to collaboratively fix this patient instead of managing them. So that's really the difference is looking at people from a health perspective and changing them permanently versus putting a Band-Aid on them. You know, we don't, we don't want, we don't, I don't treat anything actually. 
doesn't matter what they come in with, the diagnosis is insignificant to me. All I want to know is what's wrong with them. And chronic illness patients. Now, this is, this is a big, big thing. Why do people have chronic illnesses? Like 60 plus percent of Americans have at least one chronic illness. That's insane. I have people that come in to see me and they have, you know, you name the problem, and they give me a list of medications that they're on, and sometimes they're nine to 10 to 15. I had one patient with 15 different medications. I was baffled. I said, how many doctors do you have? And she said, seven. And he said, have they ever talked to each other about what they prescribe? And she said, no. I mean, this is what we're dealing with. So people get sick because of their lifestyle. It, it's not just a roll of the dice. I mean, once in a while, yes, there's a genetic predisposition. But listen, the genetics load the gun, and the, uh, the environment pulls the trigger. So it's not a purely, you know, there aren't that many purely genetic disorders. But when you look at what's going on, it's lifestyle, it's clinical nutrition, it's exercise, it's air, it's sun, it's bowel movements, it's thoughts. These are the things that help us, help keep us well. All right, so what do we want to know? We want to know about our uniqueness. When you get a blood test, blood test has a range. Let's just say we're going to look at vitamin D. And the range of vitamin D is going to be between 30 and 100. What they've done is they've taken a million people, healthy and unhealthy, and they've said, the really, really, really unhealthy people are lower than 30, but they get really unhealthy again when they go over 100. So we'll call that the range. The crazy thing that I see is that if a patient comes in and their vitamin D level is 31, their doctor says that's fine. What we want to know is, what's your functional or optimal range? So what we do in the office is we take like a 10% sweet spot right in the middle of the range, and that's our target. That's where we want you to be. Because we're not just looking to keep you not sick. We want you to be well. We want you to be optimal. So when we look at blood, urine, stool testing, and all these things, we actually look at it very differently. So when you, look, when you go to an integrative physician, you go to any functional medicine doctor, this is how they're looking at your labs. They're not just looking at whether you're in range or out of range. Bless you. So what impacts our health in a negative way? What are the top three things? Inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. Gut dysfunction, pathogens, blood sugar dysregulation, HPA axis, thyroid problems, and toxicity. These are the root causes of all of our problems. Doesn't matter what your condition, doesn't matter what your diagnosis, it's meaningless to me. These are the things I need to know. Because if you have inflammation, you can get any kind of pill. It's not gonna make it go away. Two nights ago, I was watching TV, and rarely do I watch TV like where we watch actual TV. You know, usually it's all DVR and you know, you never make the commercials. My wife and I happen to be watching a show together. And within a one hour period, we saw six commercials for some products that had the most insane side effects. And I'm thinking, I'd rather have the problem than roll the dice with those side effects. How about nutrient imbalances and microbiome imbalances? These are the bases for what's going on with us. And if I were to take all of you here and I were to do this profile of blood, urine, stool, and genetics, I can tell you where you're at right now, what your issues are, and what your problems will be going forward, and what we need to do to reverse it. Wouldn't that be interesting to know? So these are the causes of inflammation, right? We know that acute inflammation is healthy. We need that. You have an injury, you have a toxin, your immune system is unbelievable. You know, you mobilize, you don't have an immune system, you are an immune system. It's everywhere throughout your body. It's bathing every single cell in your system. You know, the majority of it lives in and around your gut. And we have this very, very powerful system that's able to knock out pathogens and detoxify your body and do amazing, amazing things without you even knowing about it. But it gets tripped up. High intensity training can cause chronic inflammation. 
environmental pollutants. Anybody toxic here? Unfortunately, we're all toxic. I mean, the water we drink, the air we breathe, there's toxins everywhere. Excess body fat, high blood sugar, high temperature grilling and frying. So I mean, so many different things cause inflammation and we need to be ahead of the game. We need to be on an anti-inflammatory lifestyle. One of the most difficult things for the human body to do is to make stomach acid out of water. Your body has to turn water into HCL. It's gotta be pretty difficult. In fact, it is. It's one of the most difficult things for your body to do. So what are the odds that it's gonna make too much? Not that great. The crazy thing is that low stomach acid causes very similar symptoms to high stomach acid. So people are walking around with low stomach acid, they're not having good digestion, then they start taking all kinds of antacids, which furthers the problem. Now you have undigested food and unsterilized food going through your system, and then you end up with a microbiome imbalance, chronic inflammation, food sensitivities, and every other problem that you could possibly imagine. We need to look at the gut and evaluate it so that we can understand what's going on in our bloodstream. Is what we take in our blood? You know, in, a, in an information age where, you know, we have so much information accessible to us, we need to dig in. You know, this U-Biome test is very easy to get and it gives you good information. You know, you can, you can actually order your own labs online now. You know, so th there's a lot of information available then you need somebody to help you interpret it. All right, so let's talk about some labs. That's what we came here for. This is a stool test. And what it does is it, starts, it breaks it down into different areas. So the first area we look at is digestion. So chymotrypsin at the top is a digestive enzyme. And it's kind of representative of the other digestive enzymes. So we want to see everything in the middle of the white checkered box. So when we look at chymotrypsin and we see, you know, it's not so bad. But when we look at putrefactive short-chain fatty acids, it's all the way in the red. These putrefactive, the word putrefaction means rotting. So you only get elevated putrefactive short-chain fatty acids if food is rotting in your stomach. It's probably not a good thing. Well, when we look at meat fibers, rare means everything's supposed to be in the green. When it shows up outside the reference range, it means that you're actually pooping out whole meat fibers because you're not digesting it. So how do you think your amino acid profile is gonna look? So again, this is a real simple test to do, and yet it can change your entire world. This is part of something called the Genova CDSA test. Here's another one, another part of it, same test. This looks at the microbiology, this looks at the microbiome. Now again, we have trillions of bacteria, and the inside of our intestinal system is really anaerobic. There's no oxygen there. So we can't really culture that many different strains of bacteria, but the ones that we can will show up on the test. There's probably a list about four or five feet long of what we couldn't culture because they're anaerobes and, and they, they, they weren't able to culture them in this particular environment. But what we see here is they're missing lactobacillus. And very often, these are patients that are taking probiotics. So lactobacillus acidophilus is one of the, the most popular common species that we see, and it's not there. But what we see is one, two, three, four, five, six additional bacteria, and as soon as you have five or more, we call that an overgrowth or a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Now you have a, a total mishmash of what's going on in the gut, and then, oh, we have a plus two candida infection. So somebody's walking around with this totally dysbiotic gut, probably not doing so well. Half the people that have these problems complain of GI issues, the other half do not. So a lot of patients will say, but I don't have any gut problems. And I'll say, well, you don't have any gut symptoms. This is, an, this is another part of the test, it's called absorption. So everything, again, is supposed to be in the middle of the white checkered box. When it's all the way out like that, that means that you are pooping out all of the fats. You have no absorption of fats. So if you're taking vitamin D, do you think you're absorbing it? Probably not.
How about this one? Beneficial bacteria. NG means no growth. Of the three strains of probiotics in the human system that are evaluated in these tests, this patient had nothing. Zero. And they had this potential pathogen, Klebsiella, at plus four strength. And a yeast issue. I mean, this is really common. I can't, I mean, I just literally just pulled out a couple of files and just, you know, just cut and paste. It's not like I had to really dig that far to find these tests. All right, here are some other good ones. Anybody know somebody with a thyroid problem? It seems like everybody's got a thyroid problem these days. What's the most common uh, treatment for hypothyroidism? <whistles> synthroid. What is synthroid? T4, right? So the American Academy on Endocrinology says that we test for TSH and free T4. And if your TSH is high and your free T4 is low, you get a prescription for Synthroid. Now, T4 is one of the two hormones that your thyroid produces. TSH comes from your pituitary gland, goes to your thyroid, stimulates your thyroid to release T4 and a little bit of T3. T4 then goes into your gut, it goes to your intestinal system and to your, and to your liver, and becomes more T3. T3 is the active hormone in the body, Every cell in your body has thyroid receptors. But nobody's testing for T3 because it's not part of the American Academy evaluation. So the patient comes in and their TSH is low, their T4 is within normal limits, their free T4 also within normal limits. So you'd say this patient is not hypothyroid. But then when you look at the T3 and you go, oh my God, that's insane. That patient has no T3 in their system. Got to look for it. And when you look, you find it all the time. You got to twist your doctor's arm to actually do the test sometimes. These bottom two tests are literally at the top of my list. See, most doctors will run, and again, I'm not here doctor bashing at all. I have the utmost respect for every doctor because we're all trained to do what we do. So we're all a product of that training. But doctors will do a CBC, a chemistry panel, a lipid profile, a urinalysis, and they will base your health on those tests. But if you're not running these tests, you don't really know what's going on. ESR is erythrocyte sedimentation rate. It tells us about the level of inflammation in the body. It's supposed to be under 26. I mean, ideally, it's supposed to be very, very low. You don't want it to be even half of 26. High sensitivity CRP is um, a very specific test for inflammation, and the high sensitivity version of it is more specific to the cardiovascular system, and less than one is ideal, one to three is average, anything over three is a significant increase in risk for heart disease and stroke. How about 16 plus? This patient, this is, this is the guy that I was telling you about that told me he was healthy when he was 70 pounds overweight and hadn't moved in, in 14 years or whatever it was because of his accident. But he didn't have these tests. It's sad because we need to see what's going on. Iron's a big deal. And iron deficiency is a, a big, 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 big problem. Because if you don't have good stomach acid, you can't absorb iron. If you have any GI problems, there's a good chance you're not absorbing iron. So the RBC level is still within normal limits. They're red blood cells. But we look at their hemoglobin and hematocrit, and they're both very low. This other patient, I did two different patients. This patient had iron at 41, which is in, within normal limits. But when we look at storage iron called ferritin, it's at 9. It should be about 150. So when you eat food that has iron in it, your body takes about 60% of the circulating iron and makes it into hemoglobin so that you can carry oxygen to your body. So it gets, you know, it gets put right into your red blood cells as hemoglobin. It takes the other 40% that you don't need and it stores it as a protein called ferritin. So if you don't eat food that's high in iron for a while, your blood level goes down, your body goes, no problem, I got ferritin here, I'll just pull it out of the ferritin storage. But when your ferritin storage is gone, you have a problem. These people are walking around among us. 
Iron saturation levels should be like 35%, they're at 5%. I mean, this is scary, scary low. Vitamin D. Who takes vitamin D? We all take vitamin D, because everybody told us to. It's good for you. Our body produces vitamin D through photosynthesis. Right? We generate our own vitamin D. It's pretty cool. It means we should be in the sun. The creator would not have made vitamin D production linked to the sun if we weren't supposed to be outside. Can't be covered up all the time. You need to get out. Well, vitamin D 25OH is the test that all doctors run. So if your number is low, they'll say, hey, you really should be up a little bit. You should probably be taking some vitamin D. But really, vitamin D 125 dihydroxy is the active vitamin D in the system. So vitamin D3 actually converts into this second one. So I think it's pretty important for us to know both of these metrics when you get your vitamin D tested. So when you go to the doctor next time, say, hey, listen, when you're testing my vitamin D, can you also check that vitamin D 125 dihydroxy? They'll probably be pretty impressed. That's the bioactive form. But now, again, vitamin D is the most potent corticosteroid, the most potent steroid hormone in your body. You don't want it to be too high. So you don't want to know this because let's say you came into my office and you were at 17.9 and we didn't test this other one. And I said, man, you should be probably taking 10,000 IUs of vitamin D3 and then we'll reevaluate you. And then all of a sudden that pushes your vitamin D 125 dihydroxy to 125 because we didn't test for it. That wouldn't be good. So we want to go know both numbers. There's some, some literature that also talks about something like this. And is vitamin D being low the cause of inflammation or a result of inflammation? So, you know, there's, there's a lot of really cool stuff out there when you start looking for it. Now, this is a patient that needs vitamin D, the second one. Vitamin D 25OH, 32.3. Vitamin D 125 dihydroxy, 30.8. I want to see both of these between 60 and 70. That's my, that's my goal. But when they're both low, you need it. You need to get outside and you need to supplement. But then we need to retest you to make sure that your body is absorbing it first and not overshooting our goal. You know, you can't just say, hey, you know what, just take 5,000 IUs for the rest of your life because everybody's different. 5,000 IUs may not be enough to get you to 40. So we want to really check these things. Ah, uh, nutrients. How about patients that come in and they look like this? Vitamin A, B1, magnesium, E. I mean, these are people that just walk into the office. Nobody ever tests for this stuff. These people need supplements. These are easy tests to run, too. How about B12? That's within normal limits, though. Anybody think that's too low? Yeah because 10% of the American population with vitamin B12 under 400 is prone to neuropsychiatric conditions. 10% of the American public who have under 400 and their B12 has a neuropsychiatric condition. That's crazy low. Why are they low? See, it's not only these are low, but I want to know why they're low. Are they just eating so poorly that they have no nutrition? Are they not taking any supplements? Do they have a chronic gastrointestinal problem like most people? So let's, we gotta figure these things out. How about adrenals? We always hear about adrenal fatigue. Adrenal fatigue, right? So this is a four sample saliva test that we do at periodic intervals, morning, noon, evening, and night. And the black line is the patient's number. And really where it should be is halfway between that green line. That's the ideal. You should wake up in the morning and your cortisol should be high, and then it should systematically go down throughout the day. So we really need to be proactive and looking at all these things to tell what can we be doing better? What can we do now? We need to sleep, poop, breathe, drink, think. We need good light. We need to stay away from indoor lighting. It's killing us. Blue light overexposure is detrimental to our health and our brain. We have these things called melanopsin receptors in our retina that they're actually testing frequencies of light, shining it into the eye, and stimulating hormone releases. 
So we know that full spectrum sunlight is essential for normal endocrine function and health in general. And we need supplements. If you're not eating bushels full of organically grown vegetables and eating a whole bunch of really healthy meats and fish, you're not getting what you need. It's just that, wor that's just that way. So some solutions. Obviously, the diet needs to be evaluated. We need to look at what we eat. We need to exercise. It's essential. You can't get away from it. Our light environment and our circadian rhythms, again, driven by full spectrum sunlight and countered by indoor lighting. We're, we're a human species that now lives inside 95% of the time. We were meant to be like Little House on the Prairie, if any of you are old enough to remember that. Right? You wake up in the morning, you go outside, you're outside in the sun, you work, you sweat, you breathe, then you go inside and you got some candles, and what happens is your cortisol comes down, your melatonin goes up, your brain turns off, and you go to bed. It's not that way anymore. And we need to supplement. These are the basics. Because we're not outside, and when we are, we're usually slathered up with some sunscreen, we probably need vitamin D. You gotta take pre and probiotics, and if you're not taking prebiotics, there's a very good chance that your probiotics are not sticking. Prebiotic fiber comes from a lot of vegetables, you know, so unfortunately, so many people are just not eating, you know, the, the vegetable-based diet that they should be, and especially kids, they're not eating any vegetables. So we need to really, you know, rethink this, uh, this entire thing. But prebiotics are critical. Digestive enzymes, again, because many of us are not just producing enough HCL. And then the HCL is actually, there's so many feedback mechanisms in the digestive system that if your HCL level is low, it's going to change the way your pancreatic enzymes function. Magnesium. Magnesium is the key to your brain turning on and off. You have something called an NMDA receptor in the brain that allows for glutamate to come in and turn on the action potential. Magnesium is actually the gate for that. And if you have low magnesium, you're going to probably have problems. And we see it all the time. B12, again, zinc. Zinc is critical in the zinc copper, zinc copper uh, ratios and fish oil. EPA, DHA is critical for the inflammatory process. It's the mediator of inflammation. DHA specifically is the key to brain development in kids. Retailers, maintain high standards. Invest in top salespeople. Get a nutrition or health coach background with some of the people that you have so they can talk about these things. You'll turn people on. You'll create value. You'll stimulate thought. You connect, you connect with people in the community that, uh, you know, have, that you bring in a doctor or a nurse practitioner, if you can, into your, you know, into your center, and you start getting some of these tests run. You'll create lifelong customers. Got to connect with local docs. Some great picks. Methyl B12. Why methyl B12? Well, B12 comes in four different categories. Usually when people take, methyl, when people take B12, it's usually cyanocobalamin. Cyanocobalamin comes from cyanide production. So not necessarily the ideal choice, but methylcobalamin is actually bioactive. So we have this whole methylation system that needs methyl support. Folate. I like folate as natural folate, but if you have MTHFR mutations, there's a good chance that you're not going to convert even natural folate into 5-MTHF. So you need to be taking methylfolate. So you know, folate comes as, as natural folate in, you know, from food, and our body converts it throughout this folate cycle, you know, with the help of this enzyme, uh, MTHFR. But this is a great folate supplement. Again, magnesium, for the reasons I said before, critical for brain function. Chelated magnesium. Vitamin D, a real convenient, easy way to do it. Spray it on your tongue and you're good to go. See, we're not only vitamin deficient, we're more mineral deficient. This is a bigger problem than vitamins, is minerals. Because the food that we eat 
is mineral depleted because of the soil being mineral depleted. Glutamine, it's not just for bodybuilders anymore. Glutamine is the main fuel for enterocytes in your gut. So we need to be taking in glutamine and we test for this on a lab test and very commonly people with GI problems have very low glutamine levels. So we're trying to fix their gut and we gotta supplement them with glutamine. Here's the, prebiotic, uh, the probiotic powder, another great one. And I wanna thank Country Life for bringing me here and allowing me the opportunity to speak to you. And uh, I really appreciate you all coming and listening to, to the talk. And I'm gonna stick around and answer questions. And again, uh, Elizabeth, thank you. Donna, thank you very much, I appreciate it. <laughs>